Welcome to the Hoover Institution's DC office. My name is Mike Frank. I'm the director here. And I will serve as moderator, but I'll also introduce Mike Petrilli. So he's in my tender mercies right now. Um, we're here today to discuss the new book that Mike edited. It's uh, Education for Upward Mobility. And we have a terrific panel after Mike speaks and describes what's in the book and some of the findings and some of the suggestions. A terrific panel to then delve a little deeper into it. Um, I'm encouraging everyone to take notes and then be ready to ask some questions at the end of that. So first, well, let me introduce Mike for roughly half an hour worth of remarks. Mike's the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. He's a research fellow with us, the Hoover Institution, and he's also the executive editor of, of one of the best education journals out there, Education Next. Previously, Mike authored the book, The Diverse Schools Dilemma. Of course, he's the editor of the Education for Open Mobility, and he's widely published in all the usual suspects, New York Times, Was Washington Post, The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, and Slate. He's also frequently a guest on television and radio. And going a little further back, Mike was one of the um, founders and helped create uh, the Office of Innovation and Improvement at the U.S. Department of Education. He's also involved with the Policy Innovators in Education Network. And as it says in his bio, long, long ago in another galaxy far away, young education professional. So Mike's an educational policy entrepreneur as well as uh, an expert in the policy area. So Mike, come on up, speak, and join us. Thank you, Mike. Mike and I uh, go way back to the 1990s, before No Child Left Behind. We were pitching a, a proposal on Capitol Hill called Straight A's, right? And uh, that went nowhere, uh, but in some ways it's come back. <laughs> or it took 15 years for it to come to fruition. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. First, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's very nice to see many friends out here. It's exciting uh, to launch a book. I have learned something from my good friend Rick Hess, which is that it is so much easier to launch a book when you don't have to write the whole thing yourself. I, I don't know why it took me so long to come to this, but an edited volume is a beautiful thing. Uh, it means you write the introduction and the conclusion. You do some editing of all the things in the middle, but most of these words are not mine. So I've also got to thank uh, the authors uh, of the chapters that are in this uh, book. Tamar Jacoby is, is here as one of the authors. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, and it really, uh, I, I hope you have a chance to look at the book and spend some time with it. All of the, uh, of the chapters are fantastic, going all the way from, from preschool through higher education, uh, asking this question about what we can do to help uh, children who are growing up in poverty or in the working class uh, climb that ladder to the middle class. And uh, way, way too much stuff in here to even scratch the surface. But I, I'm going to take you through some slides today. Uh, I should be clear that what I'm going to talk about today is really my argument after learning from all of the people that wrote for this book and others throughout the journey, uh, people like Isabel Sawhill and others. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, don't, don't ascribe these, uh, these arguments to the people who wrote these chapters, uh, though I did uh, borrow some of their uh, ideas and, and analysis for them. Okay. Uh, and I would just say that, uh, you know, here we are in Washington, D.C. I've got to acknowledge that we are clearly all living through very strange times. Uh, most of us uh, who are, you know, political junkies will be watching closely for the returns tonight. You know, nobody knows how this is going to turn out with this crazy presidential election that, that we're going through. But what is clear already is that it has made us all very aware, and I think the country more aware than perhaps it's been before, about these big divides in our society today. Uh, and as people have tried to figure out the Trump phenomenon and the Bernie Sanders phenomenon, uh, of course, there's a million different explanations, but one that many have settled on is to look at the economics and to look at what's happened to uh, so many people in this country who have for decades been hammered uh, by various economic forces uh, and cultural forces. So I'm gonna start with some of that uh, because they're sobering. Uh, and I think what it demonstrates is, is really just what a challenge we've got in terms of helping kids who are growing up poor today, that arguably the challenges are much greater than they were even 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, we need strategies that are even bolder. Uh, and I'm going to argue that our schools can play a big part in that. I'm not going to say that schools can do it all. Of course, they can't. Sometimes we have that silly argument in education. Well, you know, is it fair to hold schools accountable? or not, or can schools do it all, or not, or what about poverty? Of, co of course poverty matters a ton uh, and creates huge challenges. And of course we need to talk about other strategies. Uh, you hear some reformicons, like the folks in Neil's shop, talking about other strategy, wage supports, earned income tax credit. You hear people on the left talking about, you know, uh, 
uh, minimum wage or uh, other kinds of social support. So that is a robust conversation. Of course, those things matter. But I would still argue that regardless of what happens in the broader social policy area, our schools can do more. They can't do it alone, but there's more they could be doing. Uh, and, and I would argue even some low-hanging fruit that they could be uh, picking uh, that they are not today and they should be. So let's talk about it. So some of the challenges. We've got low upward mobility in this country. Uh, that has not changed, uh, but that is where we are at. Uh, we have growing inequality, uh, and we have a widening achievement gap. So, you know, the, this question about upward mobility, we like to think as a country that we, you know, are the place of the American dream where there's a lot of upward mobility. You can go uh, from rags to riches. Unfortunately, that just has not been true for a long time, uh, that other countries tend to do better than we can. What this shows is a relationship between a father's income and a son's income. You can look at this by uh, mother and daughter as well. And, and the United States is the second one over there, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry, the first one is the first one. And so the U.S. and the U.K. have, uh, unfortunately, the stronger relationship between intergenerational income than these other countries. So some people, even a few years ago, the president was saying at times that upward mobility was declining. That turned out not to be true. Raj Chetty and others have come out with some great studies showing that no, in fact, uh, it looks pretty stable in terms of intergenerational mobility over time. It's just stable but low uh, as compared to other countries and certainly, again, as compared to what we'd like to believe uh, is the case, okay? Uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm allowed to show this at Hoover, Mike. I think this is from the Center for uh, Budget and Policy Priorities, but uh, I'll flip through it quickly. Don't worry about that. Okay, all right. He's like, you know, all right. But uh, we've seen this and, of course, heard about it all the time on the campaign trail. Just this growing gap in income that basically at the middle and at the bottom, uh, people haven't seen a raise in decades. Uh, and, and you're hearing them uh, express anger about that now, right? But it's not just economics. Uh, we also know that as the working class got hammered in recent decades, uh, that their families started to fall apart. And what this is showing, this comes from uh, Robert Putnam's book, reproduced by Brookings. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, that uh, the children in single parent families. So, you know, that, that line that's going steeply up is for uh, parents who have a high school education or below. So what you might call the working class used to be in the 50s, what, uh, less than 20% single parent families. Now we're up over 60%, right? This is something that is impacting uh, white, African-American, Latino, all across the board. Uh, and it's an enormous change. And what that means is that, you know, not only do kids growing up poor, working class today have a lot less money than their upper middle class peers, right? Then, frankly, our kids, right? Now speaking as a father, uh, they are much less likely to have two parents, Right. That means that the one parent they've got, of course, is probably working multiple jobs, is making, you know, working super hard just to put food on the table, doesn't have the time for all the enrichment uh, and other things that us uh, upper middle class helicopter parents are doing constantly. Right. One strategy is we could convince upper middle class parents to stop uh, doing so much for their kids. Right. Jason, stop it with your kids. Stop those math lessons on Saturday mornings that you've been doing. I don't suspect that is going to actually succeed as a strategy. Uh, this shows, again, uh, from Putnam, again, the amount of money being spent on enrichment. Uh, you see the top decile versus the bottom, just huge differences, right? So, so children are experiencing things very differently. Again, we've heard that from Robert Putnam. We've heard it from Charles Murray and coming apart. Uh, but I think the, much of the country has come to understand this a little better through this campaign. And not surprising, all of this has an impact on kids' learning. What this is showing from Sean Reardon is how the academic achievement gap by income has grown and is now larger than the academic achievement gap by race, okay? You see that that income gap uh, went up, up, up in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Um, so again, not surprising, but quite sobering, all right? So in light of all that, yes, very uh, sorry to depress you and to start off on that move, what can we do? Is there anything that, that can be done? Tons of ideas in the book. Can't scratch the surface, but here are some of the three big ideas that I would put forward and that I'm uh, the arguments that I would make. Uh, again, first one is uh, while all, by all means, we need many more low income kids to go to and through four year college degrees. We shouldn't stop doing that. We got to keep on that. We also need to make sure that there are high quality career and technical routes. Number two, we need to prioritize, at least not forget the strivers. I'm going to define those as, as low-income and working-class kids who are uh, nonetheless uh, 
high achieving, who are well behaving, who are working hard, who are showing up and, and trying to use education as a ladder to the middle class. These are kids, I would argue, who often get left out in our policy discussions. Uh, and number three, to encourage all students to follow the success sequence, the sequence that Isabel Sawhill and Ron Haskins uh, discovered a few years ago, uh, including delaying parenthood. Yes, we are going to go there. Uh, I warn Mike, they talk about IEDs here at Hoover all the time. We are going to talk about IUDs, so get ready for that. <laughs> all right, that's a great line, huh? I tell you. Bring it on. Okay, so first of all, let's acknowledge bachelor degrees. There's a reason that education reformers have been obsessed with bachelor degrees. They are the closest thing we've got to a guarantee at propelling low-income kids into the middle class. 90% of low-income kids who get a four-year degree will leave poverty as an adult uh, versus half, about half, that will remain stuck there. Okay, so it totally makes sense that we're focused on that. That I don't have an argument with that. Uh, the problem is, as, as Andrew Kelly in the book uh, finds, uh, crunching some numbers, uh, some, some federal statistics, right now only 14.3% of the bottom third of the income distribution, 14.3% of those students will go to and through a four-year degree. If you look at just kids coming out of poverty, so more like the bottom 20%, it's more like 9 or 10%. Okay, so you look at that sobering number, and to me I say, Oh my God, even if we could double that number, which would be a dramatic, incredible accomplishment in terms of social policy to double the number of low-income kids to and through college as a whole, we'd be looking at 28, 29%. There's a whole lot of low-income kids that are gonna need another pathway, okay? Now, if you do wanna get lots more college graduates, my argument is that you gotta improve the K-12 system. Now, I have friends in the higher ed reform world, people like Andrew Kelly, who wrote for the book, and, and others, and many funders out there who are getting very interested in higher education reform, and, and that's fine. I mean, there's certainly a lot of potential to do a lot better for helping low-income kids to completion, and, and money is part of it, uh, is, but I would argue that, that readiness, that preparation is most of it, okay? What this chart is showing uh, is uh, very simply, the red line is the percentage of 12th graders who are prepared for college at the end of the 12th grade. This comes from the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This shows reading, because we can go back furthest in reading, but math uh, looks almost exactly the same. This looks similar if you look at ACT, SAT data. It all shows the same. It says about 35 or 40 percent of 12th graders graduate with the reading and math skills to go to college and not take remedial education. Right, 35, 40 percent. By the way, that doesn't include the kids who have dropped out before the 12th grade. So we're talking about probably about a third of our kids getting to college readiness. But what have we been telling our young people for decades? Go to college, go to college, go to college. And look, they're doing it. The blue line is showing the percentage going to college right away. As in, you know, two months after they graduate high school, they show up at college the next fall. Uh, and, and look, 2009 in the recession, it got up to 70 percent. Okay, uh, and, and by the way, if you look at you know, how many people give college a try ever and you go out a couple years after high school graduation, these numbers get even higher. I've seen numbers up towards 90%. I mean, college going is virtually universal in this country, right? But look, 38% ready. And so you wonder why you hear all these stories about colleges and especially community colleges having 50, 60, 70% of their, of their uh, incoming students in remedial education. It's because we're telling kids to go to college but they're not ready. Uh, and then they get stuck in remedial, in remedial education. They don't know how to help these kids get to these standards any, any better than the high schools do, as far as I can tell, and they drop out, right? Um, by the way, I added one more line here. I thought it was interesting to see. The, uh, the purple line is how many kids get a bachelor's degree in this country. And you look at this by high school class. So the latest data, high school class of 2005, 34% of the high school class of 2005 have achieved a bachelor's degree in this country. Not shabby, that's come up some. Look how many were ready for college. Huh, 35%. A coincidence? I think not, right? So again, the argument is if you want to improve college completion, we gotta do a better job on the K-12 side, all right? Now, you know, people like Susan Dynarski, this is from her Upshot piece, have shown that, look, there's still plenty of poor kids who have the test scores that show they're ready for college and still aren't completing. And on the other hand, you've got some rich kids who don't have the test scores but are completing. Okay, so the dumb rich kids are completing, the smart poor kids aren't. 
Uh, so there's still some room here where there's still some low income kids ready. And, and so this is where the higher ed reform stuff does make sense and does matter. OK, but again, I would argue that it's really just at the margins that we really have to get that green line way up in terms of percentage of kids ready for college if we're going to see much of a difference. OK, that leads us to the K-12 reform agenda. That is uh, why some of us are big fans of things like Common Core. This is showing the the green parts of the country where, uh, sorry to uh, Mr. Trump and others, uh, the, the Common Core is still in place. Um, but the notion of let's let's raise the bar, let's have higher standards, let's let's uh, make our expectations a lot stronger. It's why many of us are strong supporters of high quality charter schools like KIPP. What this is showing is that KIPP, uh, which is now up to something like 60,000 kids cross country, so pretty impressive scale, uh, that they now in the most recent data are showing that about 44%, I think, of their uh, of their kids who are all poor are making it to and through college. Now again, compare that to 14% for the country or even 10% for poor kids. So this gives you some hope to say, okay, some of these charter networks are figuring something out about how to get kids all the way through. All right, but that was a long way of saying that, uh, yes, keep working on the college thing, but it cannot just be the college thing, okay? That the good news is that technical degrees, and, and Tamara wrote about this in, in her uh, chapter, and it was super compelling, that if you get the right technical degree, even a two-year degree or even a one-year credential, if you get something that is valuable to the in to industry, if you pick the right field, uh, you can do quite well. You can definitely make a middle-class wage. Uh, and for a lot of young people, going through these technical education programs is a lot more compelling, is, is something that, that meets their interests, that they find uh, you know, to be uh, something they'd rather spend their time doing. Uh, and it has a huge payoff in terms of, of money. One of the first things I, I realized when me, as, as the education policy wonk, started talking to the anti-poverty crowd, people like Ron Haskins and Bell and others, and I asked them about it, and it was interesting. They love career and technical education, right? In education reform, we never talk about it, right? But the anti-poverty people say, oh, have you seen the studies on, on career academies? Look at this, these, huge, these great gold standard studies that have been done by MDRC that show these huge results in terms of, of greater pay for kids going through these, uh, more likely to be married, another thing we'll get to later. So a uh, lot of support for CTE. Um, now, here's the trick. These high quality career and technical education programs, they start in high school, all right? It simply doesn't seem to work to wait until somebody's 18 years old to, to say, we're gonna have everybody go through a very similar high school experience and then when they turn 18, you know, if they wanna go to the liberal, liberal arts path, great. Uh, if they want to instead do the technical path, great. It doesn't work. The programs that are working really well are starting in high school, getting the kids to start to do technical programs while in high school, while doing their academics, get them into a workplace around other adults, which is a really powerful thing, and apprenticeships, uh, and get them on a pipeline where they are, are seamlessly directed towards getting one of these valuable credentials, right? All makes sense. This is an example, Wake Early College. Most of us are probably familiar with the early college movement to get kids to be taking courses from uh, usually four-year college programs, liberal arts kind of colleges. Why not do it with technical schools instead, aiming for those technical degrees? Here's the trick it brings back the specter of tracking, right? That uh, we have this painful legacy in this country of, of what tracking used to be, which was that there were these Votech uh, courses and they were terrible and they were racist and they were classist and they were dead ends. And so uh, a lot of people remember those and say, well, definitely don't wanna go back to that. I would argue that the career and technical education is much higher quality than it used to be, but somehow we've got to overcome that resistance uh, to the question of don't call it tracking, call it choice. It's got to be the kid's choice, but allow lots of choices out there. Yet you go to a lot of big cities, uh, and I would argue even including this one, and there are just not that many career and technical education programs anymore. Because of the anti-tracking movement, they, they got wiped away. And in fact, right now, there's the lowest percentage of kids taking uh, CTE classes than ever before. So, uh, you know, this is one of those things that seems like common sense, but we're going to have to rebuild our career and technical education system uh, if we want to have an impact. I see Susan Sclafani uh, shaking her head. She was a former assistant secretary for, for vocational and technical education. That makes me feel uh, like we're on the right path here. All right. Second point. This one's will go faster. Don't forget the strivers. Okay. Um, we did a study a few years ago at Fordham asking teachers, who do you pay most attention to in your class, the, the low-performing kids or the high-performing kids? 
And what this is showing here is, of course, most of them say the academically struggling kids. Now, this was back in the day of No Child Left Behind, uh, before waivers or anything else, where the whole system was about holding schools accountable for getting kids over a low proficiency bar. And we have some pretty good evidence that what schools did in response was they focused on those, quote, bubble kids who were most likely to you know, be able to get pushed over that bar. Those kids, by and large, were low-performing kids. So maybe this has changed since then. Now that our accountability systems more and more so are looking at growth over time uh, and trying to look at all kids. But I suspect there's still a lot of this going on. Uh, and Tom Lovelace has a great uh, uh, chapter in the book talking about how if today you are wealthy and affluent, and you live out in the leafy suburbs, uh, your school district probably still has a gifted and talented program. Once you get to middle school, they're still tracking, as certainly in math, but probably in the other subjects as well, the honors track, this track. Uh, and of course, those tracks then lead into a lot of AP and IB course taking in high school, right? Now, we all say that we want more poor and minority kids to take things like AP and IB classes and to have more challenging courses. And in fact, even the Office of Civil Rights has said they might investigate if people aren't offering those courses. The problem is we have also at the same time said that out of our, our ideology uh, and, and fealty to quote uh, equity, uh, we don't believe that there should be tracking uh, in those high poverty middle schools. Uh, and so as a result, you, you go into a high poverty middle school, they are much less likely to have a high track for these high achievers, uh, frankly, because they listened to the anti-tracking movement and the parents out in the suburbs did not, right? Let me say it again. The parents out in the suburbs, uh, you know, heard all this argument about let's get rid of tracks, let's teach all kids and, you know, heterogeneously all in the same classroom. And they said, thanks, but no thanks, right? Over our dead body. Uh, in the cities, though, in the bluer parts of the country, they tended to listen to these folks from the ed schools and others. They got rid of their tracks. And now, if you're poor, uh, you're spending most of your day uh, with in heterogeneous groups. That means around other kids who are, especially if you're in a high poverty school, other kids who tend to be much lower performing than you. So you don't have the opportunity to move at a fast pace. You don't have an opportunity to go faster. You don't have an opportunity to take those advanced courses in middle school that might get you ready for AP in high school. Okay, this is showing from Tom's chapter. It's a little hard for you to see this, but the, the top blue, the, the top line is showing the percentage of uh, classrooms that detract in high poverty areas versus low poverty. Now, what it has shown is that actually over time, there has been some return to tracking in those high poverty areas that uh, may be because of the accountability movement or Common Core or something else, um, but there's still that gap. And, uh, and so this is one of these things, my friends on the left, it's so hard for them to hear this message, but my argument is this. You want to help poor kids? Bring back tracking, right? You want to help poor kids? Make sure that high-performing, low-income kids get the same amount of attention and, uh, uh, and, and uh, opportunity to take those advanced courses as their rich peers out in the suburbs. Now, you might feel like that's then going to be bad for the low-performing poor kids that are their peers, okay? But again, it depends how you look at equity. Uh, oftentimes, I would argue that our, our arguments for equity, they end up hurting the kids that we want to help, which are include poor kids who happen to be high performing. Uh, similarly, discipline. I mean, I could go on for days about this one. Those of you that follow education know there is a big push right now to make it harder to discipline kids. You hear about that from the Democrats on the campaign trail. They talk about the school to prison pipeline. They talk about disparities in, in suspension rates and, and expulsion rates. And it's absolutely true uh, that, that poor kids and minority kids, especially boys, are getting uh, disciplined at much higher rates. And if that is discriminatory, if they're getting suspended, let's say, for doing the same thing that white kids do that they don't get suspended, of course, that's wrong and needs to be addressed. Okay? Um, however, it is also true that the kids who are the victims of of discipline problems, who are the victims of disorderly classrooms, who are the victims of schools that are not safe, are also poor and minority. And that if we make it impossible for schools, and especially high poverty, high minority schools, to discipline kids, the kids who are going to suffer are their peers, right? And at least we need to pay as much attention to those kids as we do, uh, you know, to the disruptive kids, all right? This is showing uh, in uh, this very tragic 
study in a way that I was looking at these uh, horrible instances in Florida where kids themselves were coming from the Child Protective Services Agency that they had been abused uh, and it's subjects of domestic abuse. Not surprisingly, those kids don't do well in school. They act up in school. Turns out the kids who are with them in the same classrooms also do worse. And in particular, poor kids, uh, low income kids, especially boys, are much more likely to act up. Similar study out of Katrina, out of, uh, when, after Katrina, when kids moved from New Orleans to Houston, uh, if kids were low perform, were, I'm sorry, uh, acting out from New Orleans, which you would understand, they'd just gone through this horrible trauma, they get to Houston, they start to misbehave, it made it more likely that their peers in Houston were misbehaving, okay? Discipline's a, a big problem. Eva Moskowitz from Success Academies has a Wall Street Journal op-ed about that today defending the fact that, yes, we are strict in our schools. We are all about making sure that we have an orderly place for kids to learn, and parents want it. The kids are thriving. Uh, we need to do, you know, make sure that that's a part of the conversation, because I really do worry that we're going to go backwards on that one. And then finally, the success sequence, and then I'll be done. Uh, this is this incredibly compelling analysis by Bell and Ron Haskins, uh, that if you complete three norms in America, you won't be poor. Right? If you finish high school, if you work full time and you wait until age 21 and marry before having children, all right. This I found this so compelling in part because again, looking at those numbers about completion rates for you know college completion, that I started thinking, oh my God, you know, I, at first I was thinking that career and technical education was was going to be this great solution, but it turns out that of course it's really you have to be really well prepared to do well in CTE, just like you have to be well prepared to, to do well in college prep. What about all those kids who are barely graduating high school, right, and are not anywhere near ready academically to go to college? If they don't go to college, or if they go to college and they fail out, which is happening now, are they destined to be poor, right? Now, clearly, it would be better off if they, they did get a credential, but if they don't, are they destined to be poor? And, and what Bell and Ron have found is no, they are not destined to be poor if they get that high school degree, they work full time, uh, and they wait uh, until they're ready uh, to start having a family, okay? So that raises this question. Is there anything that schools can do about this stuff? All right, this is where it gets really touchy, right? Now, we've already talked about the work part of this. They can help kids get ready for high, higher paying jobs, okay? Back to the CTE stuff, the career academies. This fascinating finding from MDRC that the boys who went through career academies, uh, not only did they make more money, uh, than, than the uh, control group. They were more likely to get married, uh, more likely to live with their spouse, more likely to have custodial care of their children years later. Fascinating, right? That we're actually seeing an educational intervention have an impact on marriage and on parenting. I think that's pretty cool. It would be great to look at other educational interventions uh, to, to find out the same. All right, so that's one thing. Um, but again, what about the parenting piece? And, and I just got to say, I think that uh, if, if we're sober about it and if we're realistic, we say, hey, if we don't change this chart, right, if we don't have an impact here, if we continue to have a system where poor and working class kids grow up in single parent families, right, and are come into school so far behind uh, their more affluent peers, and then they recreate that. They themselves head up single parent families, and it goes on and on and on. How are we ever going to close these other gaps that we're talking about? How can we make a difference with this chart? How can we, right? And, uh, and I look forward to hearing Belle's comments on this because she, she knows way more about it. Um, so, it, you know, in the book, we talk about a variety of things that, that might be done. Uh, one, of course, is religious schools, right? This has been a traditional way, as you say, well, uh, one reason a lot of conservatives have long liked Catholic schools, for example, or vouchers for religious schools, is that these schools can explicitly preach to the young people uh, the idea that they should wait until marriage to have kids, and there does seem to be evidence that it works. A 2012 study that found that, uh, controlling for all sorts of things, Catholic high school kids were less likely to get pregnant, also get in trouble in other ways, you know, whether that was because they had the fear of God put into them, uh, or because the Catholic schools tended to make sure everybody was doing extracurricular activities, therefore not just hanging around the house in the afternoon, uh, you know, but, but it seemed to really matter. So that's one way. Uh, you know, more secular way you, you see from all the interest in character or non-cognitive skills or grit or whatever you want to call it, uh, the kind of stuff that KIPP does uh, to make sure that the, you know, the character side of the equation is a big focus. And, and helping young people, uh, again, 
uh, develop some of those performance character traits that will help them to delay parenthood, delay gratification, make good choices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other solution, um, you know, which is more generally on the left, uh, is birth control, right? And for the schools, that means comprehensive sex education, right? And this is this uh, amazing chart that, that Bell had from, uh, uh, it was the New York Times, I think in her book, uh, and, and other places as well. And if you can't see it, basically what it's just showing is that long-acting reversible contraceptives like IUDs are much, much, much more effective, much less likely to be subject to user error. Um, and uh, it, it's this technological solution that could really be a game changer, that it changes the default, that if uh, young women decide to get one of these LARCs, uh, they... Uh, they go in, they stay in, uh, they may have to make a conscious decision that they are ready to become a mother. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, you know, they could have the time to finish their education, to get it uh, started with their job, uh, to get in a stable relationship, et cetera. And we are seeing uh, that this can have a huge impact. In Colorado, they made these uh, available and, and affordable, and we see a huge decline uh, in, in births. You see a huge decline in unintended pregnancies, a decline in abortions, right? I mean, this is a winner across the board. Um, you know, where I would start is to say, hey, can we just show this at least every, uh, you know, high school or middle school in a, a kid in America, just as a starter, right? Empower them with some information here uh, could be a f good first place to start, right? Uh, and yet, actually, the CDC did a study uh, last year, and they asked health teachers, high school health teachers, what do you teach? And not surprisingly, a whole lot of places, especially in red states uh, that are not teaching kids about this stuff. So whether that's something that we need to embrace too. And again, kind of thing we don't talk about in education reform very much, but that we should. That is where you have it. So again, let me just, just so to remind you, because I do remember from my teaching days, you had to, had to review. Uh, so the three things, balance the focus on college with a, a greater focus on career and technical education. Remember the strivers and make sure that they are at least as much of a priority as the, their lower performing or troubled peers. Uh, and then number three, do what you can to teach the success sequence. All right, thanks. Thank you, Mike. And now we're going to have our panel discussion, and what we're going to do a little bit different than is normal. I'll introduce the panelists first, and then I'll pose some questions that we uh, discussed earlier amongst ourselves on email to prompt a discussion. And they can d re respond to that, take their time doing it, maybe talk about between and among each other. Uh, if Mike, you're, you have a special privileges if you want to jump in and say something relevant and <laughs> profound, you're welcome to do that. Um, and then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So can I invite the panelists to come on up on stage? And one thing I do want to do is read just a little bit. <laughs> so let's start with the introductions. Um, First, I'll start with Gerard Robinson. He is at the American Enterprise Institute. His portfolio, he's a resident fellow, Education Policy Studies, and he uh, covers just about every conceivable aspect of education policy, uh, federal, state, and local level, school choice, K through 12, for-profit schools, community colleges, and historically black colleges and universities. Another panelist we have will be uh, get to Neil Bradley. Neil. He's a personal friend from way back. He's the chief strategy officer at the Conservative Reform Network. Uh, but more importantly, I think, for the uh, uh, purposes today, Neil has spent about 20 years working um, in the House of Representatives. Almost 11 years of that was spent working for House Republican leaders. He worked for, uh, alongside, I worked with Neil for the last year or so in Kevin McCarthy's office when he was majority leader. Neil was a deputy chief of staff. He worked for three years before that in that same position for former Majority Leader Eric Cantor, and his responsibilities included developing the legislative agenda for House Republicans, overseeing policy formation in the Leader's Office, and coordinating all the committee activities. So he, had a, he has a wide uh, breadth of policy knowledge in a whole range of fields, and I can tell you from firsthand uh, experience that education policy is one of his, his real passions. Um, and but he also worked in different positions for uh, Majority Whip uh, Roy Blunt, and for the Republican uh, Study Committee as the Executive Director. And then uh, Isabel Sawhill, who we've uh, 
uh, Mike referred to it a couple different times. She's a senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings. Prior to that, she was a, a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. She served as an associate director of the Office of Management and Budget in the White House from 1993 <coughs> to 1995. And her responsibilities, not surprisingly, included that whole part of the federal budget that picks up on uh, welfare, education, healthcare policy, and so on. It's about a third of the overall federal budget. Her research is uh, renowned and very extensive. It's spanned a wide array of economic and social issues, fiscal policy, economic growth, poverty, inequality, welfare reform, the well-being of children, and uh, changes in the family. And for the purposes maybe of today, it's worth mentioning, uh, Mike referred to it in his presentation, uh, her book, along with Ron Haskins, Generation Unbound, Drifting into Sex and Parenthood Without Marriage, Creating an Opportunity in Society. And on that, um, that's where the, this uh, success sequence came up and is, I think, a very important contribution to, uh, to the debate, this debate and many other debates. So let me start off, um, <coughs> let me start with Neil. David Frum and others have argued that the Republicans and conservatives need a new agenda for the working and middle class and the Conservative Reform Network has been in the forefront of helping collect scholars and intellectuals to uh, write about these, uh, these policy ideas. Um, most of the attention has gone to wage supplements and the like. Does education still play an important role in the conservative upward mobility agenda? And what are the kind of education reforms you could uh, envision for uh, Republicans if they want to rally around something in the future? Yeah. Well, well, thanks, Mike. And Mike, excellent job. And congratulations um, on the book. Uh, you know, I do, I, I think education is a key part of the kind of reform conservative agenda. When we launched Room to Grow um, a year ago, it was 10 chapters. Um, two of those chapters were on education, one on higher education, but one also by our friend Ron Haskins on K through 12. We actually have another book by Ron coming out uh, soon on K through 12. But you're right, it didn't get kind of the attention that some of the other policies like wage supplements or uh, uh, subsidies for people to move from low opportunity areas where there are few jobs to high opportunity areas got. I, I think part of that's a natural kind of media response. A lot of the things we've been talking about in education um, didn't quite pique the interest of people of sounding new or controversial coming from the right. The idea of conservatives suggesting that we're going to give people a taxpayer subsidy for wages was the kind of man bites dog story that a lot of the press um, uh, was looking for. Uh, to my mind, frankly, a lot of the things that Mike talked about in his presentation today are the kind of man bites dog things for conservatives to talk about that really could draw attention, whether you're talking about uh, being provocative and you say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna return to tracking because tracking works. That's incredibly provocative, particularly for a, a, a federal official uh, to, to say. Um, that said, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out a lot of what I think is going right in the reform conservative movement in this space. So you talked about apprenticeship programs. We talked about those. Uh, Tim Scott, who is a senator from South Carolina, which South Carolina has a very good apprenticeship program, one of the few states that have really adopted the model and, and made it work. He's introducing legislation on the federal level that kind of replicates that and encourages employers to get involved. So I think you have opportunities like that. Um, even in the House, where I'm most familiar with, um, the, the big priority that doesn't get a lot of attention for the Education Committee in the House this year is uh, CTE reauthorization. Um, they are, and they did the same thing without any attention. It was a Reformicon idea on the Workforce Investment Act, on WIA, which is, we don't want to just throw money at these ideas. What we want to do is put money into investments where kids are getting, or in that case, adults are getting an education tied to local opportunities. And, I, and that means that these decisions are driven locally. They're driven by demand and interest from employers and by interest in students who want to participate. And I think those are the kind of reforms you're going to see out of um, House conservatives this year that kind of fit in uh, fit into that kind of framework. Great. Um, anyone like to comment on that? Okay, so I'm going to ask you something that builds off a little bit on what Neil finished with. Okay. Um, and Mike mentioned the stigma of vocab from years gone by, um, and that 
I, and I think I saw it in a recent Pew survey, I think it was Pew, not Gallup, but Pew, right, Mike? I think I'm saying it to you. That um, aspirationally, African American parents tend to be most um, wedded to the idea of college, college, and college. Um, do you think that th that legacy of voc ed is something that might be overcome if we can make an argument like Mike did that we need to do a little more attention, put a little more attention onto the voc ed side of the equation? First of all, Mike and Mike, thank you for being uh, having me here. Thank you for the book. Uh, Mike and I had a chance to meet many years ago working in the school reform movement, and he's absolutely correct. Upward mobility is something that we simply do not spend a lot of time and focus on. It's choice, but to do what? Ah, go to college. But what about everything else? And so I'm glad we're having this conversation. Um, CTE and the, and the term tracking uh, had a pretty negative uh, connotation for most working class kids in the United States just across the board. But it was particularly um, um, horrifying for blacks for two reasons. Uh, number one, unlike most people who arrived here in the United States, we came to work for free. And that went on for over 150 years. Number two, when we walked out of slavery 151 years ago, the Civil War ends, you had the Reconstruction period and you had the idea that, fine, you can now work, but you have to work here. Even when we created black colleges, there was more of a focus on the mechanical and not so much on the arts and the intellectual piece. So it was a real big push. You think that uh, you go back 100, uh, what, 121 years to Booker T. Washington giving his uh, famous uh, Atlanta speech uh, in Atlanta uh, and the role of us putting our buckets down where we are and the need to work. And then 113 years ago, you've got Dr. Du Bois got a very different opinion about the talented tenth, one using the brain, one using the hand. One thing we need to do is to uh, move that dichotomy. There's no such thing as working with your head, your hands without a head. <laughs> I mean, the two go hand in hand. And so one thing we may have to do is change how we articulate the idea of CTE. A lot of young people today, they hear CTE, they hear job. Maybe CTE is a career in technical education. Maybe it's career in technical entrepreneurship. That term alone changes the idea, and we can kind of shift how we do it. Anybody else want to? Okay. Um, Isabel? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, okay. I, I want to start out yeah. by saying that uh, I really, really like this book, and so I commend it to all of you. And if you do nothing but read a uh, concluding chapter, you will have learned a lot. And what I really like about it is, uh, first of all, it uh, not only draws on very good research, including my own, I'm glad to say, <laughs> but, uh, but no more seriously, it's very wise. Because when you write a short chapter and you're covering as much territory as Mike covered, uh, you gotta make judgments about what to talk about and what not to talk about. And I just thought the focus and the priorities that he selected were exactly the right ones. I think we have been way too obsessed about college education. And we now have a mindset. I mean, parents and everybody in the country has a mindset that if you don't go to college and graduate from college, uh, you're not gonna have the American dream. And uh, that's just become an obsession, as he argues, and I really agree with that. Uh, and I favor very much the career and technical education rebalancing and the apprenticeships and all of that. Uh, then I also agree that we've been too ca cowed by the uh, anti-tracking people. And uh, I think a lot has to do with how you talk about this. Um, you know, you, you came up with some new language just now that's useful. And uh, Mike always uses language that draws you in rather than pushes you away. And I think that, um, uh, you know, when we talk about strivers, for example, that's a positive image of the people we want to help and why we should help them because they are strivers and we want to motivate strivers. We don't want to discourage them by having the teachers not pay much attention to them or whatever. So uh, that's the, the language here is, is important. There's a lot of other things he talks about that I could go into, but I don't want to give my own speech here. I mean, he talks about 
you know, a, a rich curriculum instead of just learning literacy. He talks about the importance of what he calls character, or what academics call non-cognitive skills, and all of the research coming out is showing that those are really important. Um, but uh, of course, I like the success sequence, and I think um, what uh, you probably want me to say something about is what's the relationship here uh, between education and the success sequence, and especially the you know reducing this tremendously dramatic growth that he showed you of single parent families. Uh, nobody, by the way, is uh, trying to shame single parent families. We all know there are a lot of them, and they need our support. This is not about that. This is about changing the dynamic for the future so that more children in the future have better uh, family environments. Okay, first point there, as Mike points out, and I just want to emphasize, is there's a big correlation between dropping out of school and early unintended pregnancies and births. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean just dropping out of high school. I think we know that piece of the story. What you might not know is how many people have to drop out of or not finish college, especially community college, because of an unintended, unplanned uh, pregnancy and birth. Um, I think there's been a tendency, um, especially on the left, and I certainly would associate with myself with this to some extent, that the problem here is poor life prospects for these young girls or young women. You know, that's that they want to have babies or they're quite ready to have babies because they does nothing else in their lives. And of course, a lot of that is true. But I just really want to emphasize that it's a mistake to think that most of these pregnancies and births are wanted. They are not. I am here to tell you, based on the research from my latest book, that in a sample of uh, 20,000 women of reproductive age, this is a National Survey of Family Growth, a well-respected government survey, 73% of the women under 30 who weren't married told the survey researcher or taker um, after they'd already had a baby, uh, so you know, maybe already bonded with the child and made the best of it they could, 73% of them said they didn't intend to have that child at that time. Uh, and um, some of them go on to have abortions, but it, even then, 60% of these uh, births are unplanned, and this creates a new single parent family and single parent families are four or five times as likely to be poor as, one, uh, as two parent families. So uh, this, is a, this is a big problem uh, there, out there, and we need to focus both on improving people's motivation and reasons for delaying pregnancy and birth, but also give them the means to do so, which brings me to the story that Mike showed you about long-acting reversible contraception and I could go on and on about that. By the way, the Colorado story is incredibly impressive. Um, let me mention what, what's been accomplished here. We have reduced unplanned pregnancies and births, therefore reduced single parent families, therefore reduced poverty, uh, at the same time dramatically reduced abortion rates, and finally reduced government spending. So, you know, Mike said, well, this is a liberal um, side of the uh, political spectrum that wants this or, or that supports this. But if you're a conservative and you don't like abortion and you don't like big government and government spending <laughs> and you don't like unwed uh, parenthood, why in the world wouldn't you get behind you this? Uh, I mean, no, seriously, now I have had many conversations now, maybe many is a bit of an exaggeration, but several conversations with groups of state officials, uh, not at the governor level, but just below, the, sort of the cabinet officials at the state level, Republican governors, they're very intrigued, they want to do this, they're afraid to talk about it because it's still politically toxic. But if you ask why is it politically toxic, it's politically toxic for irrational reasons, in my view, and I'm happy to have a more conversation about that. So, um, 
uh, you know, there are the other two solutions that conservatives normally come up with, and I'll be finished soon, okay. is um, abstinence, uh, especially for teenagers. I think abstinence is great. I think we should be sending a message of abstinence, especially to our teenagers, and we are in most of our sex education programs. Uh, but they're not all going to follow that path, and especially once you get into your 20s, uh, given that the average rate of uh, marriage age is now 27, 8, 9, um, how many people are going to be abstinent until they're 28? So, um, you know, we need some other approaches here. Uh, the second alternative is get everybody married young so that when they do have babies, they'll have <laughs> them inside marriage. And that's, again, uh, fine. Um, I got married young. I was glad I did, uh, sort of glad I did. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm glad I married my husband, and maybe he would have been gone if I'd waited too long. But um, I, I, was, I was not, I was too young. Uh, but the problem with that solution, of course, is in today's economy where you need a whole lot of education and you need a stable job and you need time to find a partner that you want to marry or at least have a stable partnership with, that takes time. And if you have a baby first, it's going to make it much harder not only to get on with your life, your education, your career, your job, but it's also going to be harder to get married because I'm here to tell you Men are not crazy about marrying women who already have children by another guy, which is what we have a lot of right now. So I'll, I'll stop there except to say um, bravo to, to Mike. Thank you. Let me um, be calling audible on a question. Some of the data on, um, uh, on the kids going into college and how many completed, how many end up not by income level that Mike showed on the, some of the slides. Um, is there an overlay down the road? Was the question in a way is can you get more uh, maybe support for alternative routes than just a four-year college? What about all the student loan debt that's accumulating and, and the kind of the experience that individual families have and, and neighbors and friends have and they hear about it going forward that uh, well maybe uh, the, in the decision to go either to a two-year or a four-year school or go toward voca a vocational um, track is going to be a, a function of stories they've heard about all the debt and how much that puts people in a bad place, especially if they spend a year or two accumulate debt and don't even get a degree to show for it. Is there any sense that we might be able to turn this around in a little bit and perceptually because of the student debt issues that are out there? So you mentioned uh, the Pew study. So 86% mm -hmm. of Hispanic families believe that going to college was very important or extremely important. 79% for African Americans, about 66 for whites, and so there's a really big push. So one thing that we did in Virginia, um, I was Secretary of Education uh, under Governor Bob McDonald. One of the first things we did in his administration was create a commission on higher education. It's called Top Jobs for the 21st Century. And the goal was to bring together a lot of higher education uh, leaders and to say what is it going to take to make sure that our high school graduates and college graduates are able to enter the workforce. Well, one thing we decided to do was to support you know, a 2-2 plan, where students would graduate with a high school diploma and an associate's degree the same day. And by doing so, you were able to A, save money, have the classes paid for on this side of the fence um, without having them to quote unquote incur debt. Another thing we decided to do was to promote the idea of post-secondary education. That's different than saying four-year degree, because we could focus on licensure, credential, certificate. We talked about, or oh, gave examples of someone who says, you know, do you like to drive trucks? There's an eight-month program at the community college where you'll come out making $65,000. Our teachers don't start off making $65,000, and they've got four years minimum, or if I use Mike's eight-year worth of school. So there are ways of trying to promote the idea of being much more entrepreneurial, at entrepreneurial as a student, associates, and maybe a certificate, maybe licensure. Here's where CTE is important. And it's frankly telling people just because you don't have a degree doesn't mean you're a failure. I think it's uh, Abigail Thurston who said, you know, either you go to Yale or jail. You know, I use the opposite of saying, you know, this is not more house or no house. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there are opportunities for people to, uh, to earn a living and make a middle class status and not have a four year degree. We've done it for a long time and I think we can continue to do it. I, I mean, I, I think that's right. I mean, I think 
the challenge we face in this push, particularly from elected policymakers, on you know it, it's all about colleges. You know, I, I think we should acknowledge that uh, you know elected officials, most of whom have at least a four-year degree, mm -hmm. most of them who went on and got a, a law degree. If you're talking about our federally elected officials, they're a little gun shy about standing up and saying. You know, you don't have to follow <laughs> that path yourself. Now, the reality is that we shouldn't think of it that way. The reality is, is that current federal policymaking is encouraging a lot of people to take on debt that they can't discharge, that they can't repay, and then having nothing to show for it at the end of it because they didn't complete community college or they didn't complete their four-year school. Policymakers ought to think about their obligation to those people and whether or not the message that we're sending and the policies that we're adopting are truly tracking people into a college degree program that not only they're not prepared for, but that actually is gonna leave them worse off than if we hadn't put them on that track in the first place. And getting policymakers to think in that regard is a challenge, but I mean, as Gerard demonstrated, it, it, it can be done when you put it in the context of positive alternatives. A year or two ago, I wrote a paper with a colleague called Should Everyone Go to College? Mm -hmm. And I re repeated the standard uh, academic literature here, which says on average, college is a good deal, even if you have to borrow uh, to pay for it. Uh, the rate of return is pretty high on average. But then if you look at it by the type of institution you attended, the kind of um, field you majored in, and most importantly, whether or not you finish or not, uh, there's a whole bunch of kids for whom it's not an economically uh, valuable proposition at all. And we forget about this very wide distribution. Mm -hmm. And I think my, uh, one of my favorite uh, charts from uh, Mike's presentation is this one that shows that uh, the proportion of people who graduate from college is no higher than the proportion who are ready, quote unquote, for college. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that the proportion attending or enrolling is almost twice as high, uh, I think is telling us something about that the problem is K through 12 mm -hmm. and that the solution is not just pushing more and more people into this pipeline from which they are not uh, graduating. Last question I'll ask, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, flip it a little bit, the Striver aspect of Mike's presentation. Neil and I have talked about this over the years, and Neil wrote about it recently, so I'll give him a chance to maybe comment on it. But the idea was relative to Strivers at the high school level who might want to study college level work and making, in a school which doesn't offer that, what about the idea of making Pell Grant type assistance available that those students who study the college level work even though they're 16 or 17 years old. Neil, you want to maybe comment on that a little bit? And yeah, yeah you, you know, it's, ex it's exactly, I mean, the, the kind of common sense thing you think we ought to do. So most states have some type of dual enrollment program for high school students. States vary tremendously in terms of what their policies are for who pays. Um, in some states, uh, the state picks up the cost uh, with the local school district. Um, in, in other states, they ask the student or the student's parents. Uh, to pick up part of the cost. The way we framed it is this. If we're going to give you, because you're eligible for a Pell Grant, a Pell Grant to go to a college, a community college, and take a remedial course, why in the world we wouldn't we let you, just because you haven't quite graduated high school yet, access a Pell Grant to get college credit early in the process? Um, and it's more than maybe the number of people it would benefit, to me, it's the kind of message that it sends. And the, you know, and the message is, if you're one of those strivers, we want to make these straight-laced federal programs more flexible for you so that you can get a head start on, on, on your college degree. Do you want to comment on that? You like it? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, let's turn to the audience. And um, when you get the microphone, maybe just let us know who you're affiliated with. Front row here, David. Uh, my name is Mark Nadell. I'm not affiliated with anybody. Um, <laughs> I had two quick ones. One is, did you look at mentoring, whether that um, letting students have contact with somebody who's been to college who can help advise them, particularly if their parents didn't go? And 
can't give them the tips. And the second one is I'm curious, you'd mentioned, um, Mike, focusing on better K through 12 to get a higher percentage capable. We give out, it, it seems like the state can decide, give you a piece of paper, a college degree, now we don't have to pay for your rest of your education, even though you really don't have what I think in this room we would consider a high school education. You have almost a high school education. Is there a way that the states would pay to get you up to the level of it's really remedial high school subjects, whether it's in community college or called something else? I'm not talking about mentoring. I'm going to need a mic. Or sure. What you go for? All right. Uh, not, not much in the book about mentoring, though. In Andrew Kelly's chapter on higher education, there is some material in there about some of the reforms happening at the higher ed level, including providing a lot more support to low-income kids going through the process. And the, you know, the argument's very sound, I think, which is that upper middle class kids get a ton of support from their parents, who by and large went to college themselves and have a whole network uh, and can give all kinds of advice that that first-time college goers, they just, you know. Things that might seem simple to other people, they just don't have no idea. It's a whole new world and th that they need some extra help as well. So I think there's a lot of effort on that. I mean, th this question about the high school diploma versus college going, I mean, this is one of these areas where it seems impossible for us to have uh, an honest conversation about this. Uh, and, and again, we have the, I, I always fight with Andrew Kelly over this uh, on Twitter and otherwise. I wish he were, he were here. Uh, but you know, he'll, he'll sort of points to, to me, you guys in K-12 fix it. And I point to him and say, you guys in higher ed got to fix it. I, when you look at those numbers, if you take them, if you believe them, and I think that all the evidence shows about 40% of high school graduates are college ready, and you say, we're only going to give high school diplomas to kids who graduate college ready, that means we're going to deny 60% of the kids a high school diploma. That is not going to happen. Neil's, y Neil and Gerard, you guys have worked more in politics. Is that going to happen? No. <laughs> that, that is not going to happen, right? Uh, there is always going to be a gap between whatever standard you have to meet to be a high school graduate and college readiness. And so I think the way we have to deal with that is, again, back to higher ed and say, higher ed, you need to stop admitting people who are way below college ready. If the kid has a high school diploma but is reading and doing math at the sixth grade level, why on earth are you admitting them into your community college? Why don't we consider that to be just as bad as the for-profit colleges, you know, that are preying on low-income kids? You know, that, that Senator Warren wants to, you know, uh, John King to go after those for-profit colleges. Fine. But go after the community colleges, too. Why? They, they know those kids aren't going to succeed, uh, but they take their Pell Grant money. And in many cases, they even encourage them to take out student loans for living expenses. Why are we doing and, and the reason is we are not comfortable in this country saying to somebody, I'm sorry, but you know, you, you don't get to go to college because you're not ready. And, and, it's, and, and we are not comfortable. You know, we're just not comfortable with that. We're used to being the land of two, three, and four choices. You know, Bell has written saying that maybe uh, Pell Grants uh, shouldn't pay for remedial education or we should think about ways to reform the way that funding works, but the incentives are all wrong. The incentives are to send kids to college who aren't ready for the colleges to accept them. They hide behind open access and it's a disaster for many of many of these kids. The, the four-year degree or bust, there has got to be a better way of doing this. Um, so that's my stump speech. There you go. Mentorship is important to a lot of first-generation students. One of the best programs in the country, in fact, is at a community college. Uh, it's called Project Success. It's at El Camino Community College in Los Angeles, California. Uh, it's received a number of national and international awards, taking first-generation students, mentoring them through the process, particularly at a community college because we know a lot of students go there and they never come out. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so mentorship is important. Second, you have to change this through regulation. Uh, when I was in Florida, I was shocked to find that we spent $185 million a year on remediation for students who we gave a high school diploma to. $185 million. So I put together a commission, higher ed and K-12. We took a look at PISA, TIMS, SAT, ACT, identifying the numbers you needed in order to be college ready. We looked at our own standards. We created a number, and we said if you're a Florida high school student, if you get number A in reading, B in math, you can go to a Florida college without need for remediation. Immediately the parents are excited because now they don't have to pay tuition for non-credit bearing courses. That's something we can do in reg, not so much first state policy, we can debate that, but we can make a change and frankly we need to. 
tell us just a, did you consider taking some of that $185 million, giving it to the high schools, and so even kids who had their degree, mm -hmm. but would have had to take remedial, can come there for free to take high school math, a high school science course. So in addition to their high school degree, they actually then got ready and then could go without having to the college without it. That's a good visionary question. I had to make political realities, and that wasn't even something I put on the table. We, we had a, a cool event idea. at Fordham a few months ago uh, with a group from Massachusetts that runs a program where they go into high schools that are sending a lot of first-time college goers to college who end up in remedial education, doing the, the tutoring in high school to help the kids pass the placement test so mm -hmm. they don't get placed in remedial education, and it's showing a lot of promise. Has been, it, um, my name is Miriam Friedman. I'm a lawyer in public education, living in California, but I happen to be here for the weekend. Yay! <laughs> and this has been a wonderful um, session. I really, really, really appreciate it. I do have a pet peeve about language, and that is the name we give single parents. Uh, my daughter's a single parent. She's not poor. She's a doctor. My mother was a single parent. She was a widow. She wasn't poor. She was smart. I went to a great college. I think it's really, so every time I hear these discussions, I get bound up and jarred at the notion of single parent. To lump all these folks under, under one word, I think you lose people. You kind of lost me in the discussion. And I'm wondering if it should be something like, single parent without resources or single parent without education at the get-go, not to talk about single parents. It's too broad language. I guess that's uh, <coughs> mostly directed to me. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, I, I try to make the point that you know we shouldn't um, tar with a broad brush here, and we certainly shouldn't in any way uh, say that there aren't a lot of single parents who aren't doing a great job. Uh, you may be interested that when I give talks on my most recent book, I get a lot of single parents who come up to me afterwards and talk to me about uh, their reaction. And so I wrote uh, last spring, I think it was, a short piece on what I called Single Mothers by Choice. And in it, I distinguish between uh, the young woman or often teenage girl who has an unintended, unplanned pregnancy and gets into all kinds of trouble as a result. When I say all kinds of trouble, I mean she is poor. And she does drop out of school. And she doesn't have a partner, et cetera, uh, even though she wants one. Uh, versus a woman who gets to be, let's say, 30 years old, is well-educated, uh, hasn't found the guy of her dreams or just isn't interested and uh, decides to become what I call a single mom by choice. That's a very different group, and I have written about them, but they're a very small group, uh, you know, like your, your daughter. Hi, I'm Jenny Gentles. I'm working with American Federation for Children, and I'm concerned about the strivers you described who are in these um, schools, often in low-income areas. Schools aren't serving them, and I'm wondering if the panelists um, have any thoughts about offering scholarships, vouchers, um, to, these, to these students so that they have opportunities to go to schools that might be able to better suit their needs. <laughs> I'm all for it. Vouchers, <laughs> charter schools, tax credits, 529s, the charitable contribution, whatever you can come up with that gives people choices, I, I, I think is a, um, I th in my opinion, you need all of the above. Uh, you know, in some places you're, you're not going to have, uh, you might not be able to develop huge tax credit programs um, or take the city we're in right now. You may be able to only serve so many people with the, with the congressional, um, the federal scholarship that we have for, for DC students. But we've managed to serve a whole lot of kids um, through the propagation of charter schools. So I, I'm, I'm an all of the above 
approach to picture. Yeah. There's some evidence, uh, you may know more than I do, Mike, but uh, there's some evidence that if you offer some carrots to uh, kids when they're still, let's say, in middle, end of middle school, early high school, uh, that they're going to have a chance to go to college and that the financial burden is not going to be too great. Uh, they shift their, um, the way they spend their time. Uh, they study more and hang out less. Uh, and uh, this is from a study at MDRC. I found it quite interesting. I wrote a little piece about it recently. You know, I, I spend a lot of my time with the education reform crowd, which these days means mostly people on the left, right? You go to a big school reform conference, most <laughs> people there are, are on the left. And most of them hate this idea, right? Because uh, it really offends their sense around equity. Uh, you know, and we have these conversations all the time. I mean, every day there's a story about, you know, is Eva Moskowitz pushing some kids out or not? Is she creaming some kids or not? Are we, you know, are, are these charter schools truly serving all kids or not? Do the voucher programs, are they allowed to use their admission standards or not? Uh, maybe it's easier for somebody on the right or the center right to just say, to acknowledge, look, you know, we don't know how to turn the Titanic around, and so we are okay with building lifeboats. And if the lifeboats are working, let's build more lifeboats and let's help kids, as many kids as we can, uh, get the help they need. And you know, if part of that is that, yes, some of these schools are gonna serve poor kids, they're still poor, but they're somewhat not quite as disadvantaged as the other poor kids. Their, their parents you know, have the wherewithal to apply for a scholarship or to apply for a charter school. Um, you know, I am okay with that because I think those are the kids who are not well served today because the traditional public school system with their ideology looks at them as not a priority. And, uh, you know, but there's certainly, you know, people on the left who just feel like, uh, well, if it's, if, if not all kids can't get it, then nobody should get it. And I think that's kind of crazy. And, uh, and that's why you see this divide, I think, between uh, people on the right who tend to support charter schools and vouchers, including voucher programs where the schools are allowed to use their admissions requirements, only accept kids you know, who meet their admission standards, uh, and people who say, well, if, if it's, you know, I'm okay for choice, but it's gotta be open to everybody, and there's gotta be a lottery is the only way that you make a decision. Mike brings up an interesting point about school reform and either party politics or ideology. Um, some support charter schools, but not vouchers. And I said, when did it become unpopular for people on the left not to give poor people money? <laughs> <laughs> the largest voucher program in the United States is called Section 8 Housing. Yeah. It's the National Housing Voucher Program. And yet, when it's time to give poor people money to pick a school, suddenly they become ignorant. But it's okay to give them money to pick a house or housing opportunities. And I'm oversimplifying, but I just find it interesting mm -hmm. that when we choose to help the poor with a voucher. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Dave Yarmchuk. I work at Center for Inspired Teaching, which is a, which is a nonprofit right here in D.C. that supports K-12 education and which, by the way, operates a K-7 through charter school here in the city. Um, my question is about the, the tracking uh, question, because for me, I know I appreciate that there's a chapter in the book around um, early, early childhood education that the birth through five. So if you think about the idea that some um, that we have a, a significant achievement gap for kids when they enter, even at pre-K three, that there's an achievement gap. Um, what's to prevent tracking from kind of exacerbating that, um, especially for low-income kids or, or students of color in a school that might have um, mixed income levels, so that you know you come in and your four-year-old gets tracked to a low level because maybe you're lower income than the other kids in the in the school. So first of all, let, let's let's clarify between tracking and what you might call ability grouping, right? So. You know, at, I, I don't think anybody wants an elementary school, for example, for there to be different tracks in terms of a totally different curriculum or one track that leads to, you know, challenging courses and another that the kids are crayoning all day, right? I mean, we've seen that has happened in our schools. We don't want that. Uh, now, the different question is, you're a first grade teacher, you've got a classroom full of kids who are all over the place. Some kids already reading, you know, sixth grade level, other kids, uh, you know, not still having problems with their letters. Do you have to teach that whole group of kids together all day long? And I think most people would say, well, no, obviously you can't. We're going to allow to group kids for part of the day, call it differentiated instruction if you want, uh, but, uh, you know, but we're going to do some grouping so that there's some time when the kids can get the instruction targeted to where they're at. 
Um, I do think it's tougher in these mixed income schools because oftentimes because of the achievement gaps, those groups are going to be, you know, going to often look like there's group by socioeconomic or by race, and that makes all of us uncomfortable. Thing is, the overwhelming majority of our schools in this country are not mixed income, right? They are high poverty or they are low poverty, um, you know, that because of the segregation. So my argument is, uh, I mean, your, your school, as I understand it, is, is very integrated and, and diverse, which I think is great and it's a, you know, huge, huge success story. Most schools in D.C. have, you know, nothing but poor kids. And it's in those schools that I'm most concerned that they, we allow there to be ability grouping and at the higher end, at the middle school, high school level, a chance for the higher performing low income kids to get the challenge that they need. Wh when people look out and they say, how do we get more poor and minority kids uh, into college? Or how do we get more poor minority kids into elite colleges so that we might get them into elite medical schools and law schools and da 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 and, and you see people say, well, let's find those kids in high school that are doing well and encourage them. That's too late. You know, if, if they have not had a chance throughout their K-12 career to have that chance for acceleration, like their rich peers in the suburbs get, I just think that we perpetuate. So uh, rather than looking at the, dis the sort of inequities within a school, I would look at the inequities between, uh, you know, high achievers in this kind of school versus high achievers in that kind of school. Sorry, I have a long answer. I wouldn't as far back there. Uh, uh, Pat Burke, Philanthropy Roundtable. Um, I'm wondering if the book addresses or if the panel has thoughts on mobility within the context of rural education. Um, you know, a, a lot of these reforms and innovations usually are concentrated in urban areas where there are hard massive charter networks and all the rest. I'm wondering if you guys see anything as that's moving the needle um, in rural areas. It's a great question. So hard, Gerald. Gerard? So. Virginia is really two states. Um, at one point, we were ranked, I guess, number six in the nation for the number of people 25 and over with, an, with a uh, bachelor's degree or higher. But if you lopped off northern Virginia, the number looked very different. So in Virginia, we have something called the horseshoe. And there are nearly 2.1 million people who live in this horseshoe, pretty poor part of the state. If it were its own state, it would rank 50th in terms of academic achievement. But because it's in a larger commonwealth, we're ranked higher. So our community college system, which I think is one of the stronger ones in the nation, uh, have partnered with high schools. Because too many of those adults, frankly, have never completed high school. So the goal is to work with them to give them a GED. And not per se to have them come to the community college. Maybe high school, maybe a YMCA or another uh, place. So that's one opportunity. Uh, number two, they're taking people who are rural graduates of G, you know, high school, GED, or college, and having them come back, the whole mentorship, and saying, I was just like you. Bringing Gerard in is going to excite me one. But someone who grew up there in a neighborhood and say, I did it because rural, uh, rural education, rural education, and urban, they are different worlds. I think Virginia is a really good example. You know, and technology has given us a, a ton more opportunities than good we've point. ever had before. Um, I, you know, I grew up in semi-rural Oklahoma, um, and if you wanted to take, uh, I took Latin at one point, and it w literally was a mail order course in my high school. My high school didn't mm -hmm. offer Latin, and that was the best technology of the day, right, was to, to, to do an exam and send it off in the mail and see what came back. T today, <laughs> my old school is completely wired, right? It, you know, if they, I, I assume if there's a kid there who wants to take Latin now, he has a tremendous opportunity. So it, you, technology, like it's doing in healthcare, like it's doing in a whole lot of other places, really has the chance to improve education in these rural communities. It's going to look a lot different than it looks like in the urban areas, um, and, and that's okay, but it's important for us to talk about because from a policy maker standpoint, we have so many from rural areas that we have to have something to offer them in the context of reform. Um, so there's a kind of, I'm going back to the leveling the playing field between college and um, vocation, technical education, career and technical education. So there's a really radical idea being floated, that was floated out there this year by who else then, the thought leaders of the Republican Party, Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush, um, for basically cracking open Title IV spending and allowing ho federal higher ed spending, Pell and other money, to go to alternative forms of post-secondary education. I mean, 
frankly, I think there's like no better idea, but we're going to get a big push back from the world of colleges that are going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, you're using our Pell Grants for welding class? You know, we need that money. Wonder what you all think of that. Well, I think it's a great idea. Um, uh, I think uh, both uh, Senator Rubio and Governor Bush probably deserve a lot of credit for being uh, ahead of the consensus and the discussion. Um, maybe it helps that this has been kind of a lackluster policy primary. Um, and it didn't get as much attention. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Is it vital <laughs> in another context? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that someone has to lead off in that conversation. Um, my guess is, is that you don't get there in one fell swoop. Um, that you begin by expanding it out this much, and then by this much, and then this by this much more, and, and, and that's how you ultimately implement that policy, but it's nice to have thought leaders on it. I like the idea. I also like the concept of allowing uh, families to use 529s a little sooner. I like to do that. Uh, and as long as uh, Senator Rubio would allow me to use uh, Title IV to major in philosophy, I would like it even more. I have a degree in philosophy, so I hate when I hear that philosophy comment. <laughs> By the way, I should, uh, one of the things that, uh, and I don't recall if it was in Governor Bush's plan, but certainly Senator Rubio has talked about, is this has all got to be combined with some type of accountability. The worst oh, thing right. that the, the, the current higher ed establishment wants to talk about is accountability for what happens to their graduates, and their, you know, they promise them the moon, and these aren't just for-profit schools. These are a lot of community colleges, a lot of state schools, and it turns out that these kids don't end up achieving that. Even Stanford. Even and and <laughs> you know my, my favorite is we were working on this on the Hill, and the, the president of an Ivy League school. I'll leave it at that. I don't want to mention which specific one. Came in and was as if somehow we were devaluing the degree and calling into question the degree that they would get from this East Coast Ivy League school. And our response was. Your kids are going to be just fine. <laughs> uh, what I'm worried about is the kid who chooses which community college or which college or which welding program to go to based on this promise of what it means for them in the future when that school has no track record of ever providing that to its graduates, and they deserve to know that information. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that we have this tremendous debate about value added in the K-12 through system but we've only begun to scratch the surface on beginning any kind of discussion of the value added of higher education, any form of higher education. Hi, I'm uh, Preston Cooper from the Manhattan Institute and I'm kind of going on the same topic. Um, I was wondering if any of you all had any thoughts about um, private, uh, a, a role for the private sector in financing post-secondary education, um, partly as you know, a form of accountability? Like income share agreements, that sort of thing? Share agreements and mm -hmm. things like that. That sounds reformicon uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, it is. So I, it is, and it's, <laughs> it's, um, uh, Andrew Kelly writes about it in our, our uh, Room to Grow series. Um, my view is it ought to be one of multiple options, right? That, that the more options we have for people to finance, um, A, it's just more opportunity for people, but two, it's gonna tell us things. Um, you know, to, to me, it's not that we're gonna open up college to a great number of people through income sharing. It's we're gonna learn from market feedback what some people think about different opportunities in different education. That to me is valuable information, uh, you know, and and the more of that you have, the, the better off we are. So, like in K through 12, I am in the let a thousand flowers bloom, give as many people as many options as possible. I think there's a risk um, that we could potentially go too far on measuring the what I just called the value add as you know an increase in your income. Um, I don't think we want to, um, th this is not an argument against, it's just a little footnote or caution of, you know, there are other reasons why we need an educated population. Uh, we need parents to be educated in their parenting roles. We need 
voters to be educated in their voting roles. God knows I think we're seeing a problem there right now, uh, if I may add a little editorial here. But, um, uh, you know, the, but, you know, fine to have it as one mechanism there. My, my colleague Beth Akers has written about this. You had your hand up before. Okay. Um, David Lapan, I'm with an education nonprofit. Uh, so, a fairly quick two part question on CTE. First part um, Is there good data? Is there enough data now to determine, like we do on uh, preparation for college, whether high school students are adequately being prepared to succeed in CTE? And the second piece is like as – higher ed CTE? Is that what you mean? Right, okay. right. Uh, and the second piece is, again, if we rebalance, uh, you know, college with higher ed CTE, do we then relieve pressure on fixing K-12? L let me take that second one first. And, and, you know, that's where I started off. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. We can finally uh, have a solution for all those kids who aren't ready for college. And – you know, people had to hit me over the head a few times, uh, but uh, tomorrow's smiling. But, you know, look, the, these high-quality CTE programs, either at the high school level or once you get into post-secondary, you cannot succeed in them if you don't have solid math and reading and writing skills, mm -hmm. right? Or if you, you know, don't have the right non-cognitive skills. In other words, uh, they're not going to let you play around with an expensive, dangerous machine if you act up all the time and you've had discipline problems or, you know, you, you know, so... So this is not a route for the kids who are not ready or not, you know, high enough achieving for college prep. Uh, I, and I've been convinced that for most of these high-quality CTE programs, yeah, you've got to have the same high level of skills coming in. And I think, if anything, that makes uh, our challenge that much greater. I think it's really a challenge for, say, pre-K to 8, right? That, it, you know, if, if we had a, a common approach in pre-K to 8 where we said we need to get really push the pedal to the metal for low-income kids in particular but get all kids to this you know, fairly high level of math, reading, writing, and all the rest that comes along with that uh, by the end of eighth grade, then, you know, high school, you have these great opportunities. You can have the college prep schools where you take a lot of AP classes and IB or dual enrollment and all that, or you can have these high-tech career and technical entrepreneurial, I like that, programs, uh, you know, that, that are doing the academic stuff plus the technical. It just, w when you have a ninth or tenth grader uh, who is way, way behind, uh, there are not any great options. I mean, I've seen in New York City, they've, they've tried and had some success with special schools to catch those kids up, but it's hard. Does that make sense? Uh, you know, in terms of what it means to be career ready, I mean, we all throw that around, Common Core, college and career ready. I think, you know, most of us would admit that it's the, the evidence is more solid on the college front um, than it is on the career front. Again, uh, the notion is you still, get, you know, you gotta have these high level skills regardless of which path you're going. I, I don't think uh, that the best programs I've seen in CTE don't really distinguish between high school and post-secondary. I mean, there are these programs that start in high school and, you know, you just seamlessly continue into the post-secondary program. You graduate, you know, high school with a, post -sec with a technical degree or a technical certificate. One quick announcement, we are, will have a reception after this, so you will see the food over there. So this will be the last question, <laughs> so there's no pressure on anybody. This young gentleman here has been very patient for the whole time. You win the final question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I've been reformulating this question, and, and it really it tags into a lot of the discussion that we've had here, and Mike, especially what you just mentioned there. And Gerard, I'd like to expand uh, on what you mentioned earlier about, and I was not aware of this, even though I've been in Virginia here, as you know, mm -hmm. um, that you gave superintendents the authority to award associate's degrees. Did I hear that right? From no, no, the student would finish high school and earn an associate's degree from a community college. From a community college. Yes. Okay. I want to take it a little bit further then and get into what you said, Mike, about the con thing. Have we ever considered grade configuration going from a K to 14, where superintendents <laughs> are responsible for that? It eliminates a transition, holds them responsible to make sure that they're done, Mike, you said, not being college ready in when they go on. So uh, any thoughts on that? I know it's an out of the ballpark idea here. So um, Governor Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, in fact, is interested in having high schools 
award associate's degrees. He, bring, he said, basically, every time I go to my community college or technical college community, they want more buildings. We're like, no, technology, less buildings. So I would take a look at uh, his idea. That could be rather, rather radical, for, particularly for the Commonwealth. Does that mean students would have to stay home with their parents for two extra years? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> no, I don't have a No. Okay. Any, any, anyone else want to finish up on that question? No? Okay. Well, please join me in a warm round of applause.